My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... The thing is, I want to learn. And as it turns out, I work with people who know a lot about classical music. Every week on this show, one of my coworkers will give me a homework assignment, a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. This is the symphony that Schubert wrote, but never finished. He never finished it, but no one cares because it's a nice one. A nice one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classical Classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and today my instructor is Ms. Jade Simmons, who is a concert pianist, author, lecturer, creator of Emerge already, which helps emerging artists build their careers. She also writes for the Huffington Post. And in her spare time, she flies around the city and making sure the citizens are safe from 'er (laughs) (laughs) ne'er-do-wells. Jade, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So what are you going to be teaching me about today? Well, you know, when I got the call to come down and and, uh, be on your show, I was asked about kind of what was my first real inspiration where classical music was concerned. And I had to give it some thought. And even though I make my career as a pianist and rarely get a chance to go out and hear um, a great orchestral performance, I can honestly say the first piece that I heard that I knew I was going to be involved in classical music for the rest of my life was Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, Mm -hmm. um, the first movement. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that piece and and how it's inspired me. And um, I don't know how it's just been a part of my life for a very long time. Awesome. Well, how how old were you when you first heard the piece? Well, you know, I started playing piano at a pretty late age, at the age of eight years old. And then I have these wonderful parents who let me do anything and everything when it came to extracurricular activities. Very typical, overscheduled American kid. (laughs) And one of those activities was I was in the youth symphony and I played viola. And uh, I was probably, man, 12. And we were playing the, the Unfinished Symphony in youth symphony. And I was in the viola section, which of course has the most amazing harmonies in that piece. And I was hooked. I mean, I thought I already liked classical music, but it was that piece um, that I heard and thought, I cannot imagine living without this music. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And to, and to experience that kind of feeling about oh. a piece of music at that age. I mean, I remember liking music, but I mean, the this, this stuff that I liked was, um, you know, Billy Idol. Yeah. And- <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I have a picture. Uh, my mom has a picture of me as a little girl. I was probably seven or eight and I had I was gonna date date myself but I had a Walkman on (laughs) I don't know if you even know what a Walkman is yeah (laughs) oh yeah yeah you know with a little cassette player and the headphones and I'm totally bopping out in the picture and I asked her I said what was I listening to and she said you know Jade there was no telling she was like it could have been hip-hop it could have been uh you know R&B and it could have been classical Mm -hmm. and so I grew up hearing lots of different types of music and that's why I think I remember the Schubert so much because I didn't really make a distinction between Mm -hmm. classical music and everything else. So your parents just kind of exposed you to all different kinds of music and and you just so you for you classical music was just another kind of music. Yeah I heard it I remember it just did something different it felt Mm -hmm. different in my body if that if that you know not to sound so esoteric but I I no, just totally. remember um, hearing that and feeling like it was a language that I hadn't yet learned. And now that I was hearing it, um, it was kind of the, the main language that I wanted to speak. Now, you know, I went through years where that was pretty much all I was listening to and all I was playing. And now in my career today, it's back to this really broad scope of mixing all of these different genres that I look back now um, have been such a great influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I perform, 
Uh, and when I look over my repertoire, so many of the pieces in many ways sound like the Schubert. They're darker. Uh, that's what I'm drawn to in classical music, minor keys. I rarely mm-hmm. play anything in major. Um, so it's just, it's had this kind of haunting influence. Well, let's hear some of it. This of course. Is, I mean, I've, I've listened to it a few times. And mm-hmm. actually, unlike a lot of the stuff that, that people who've come on have um, have wanted to talk about, I've actually heard this piece several times. Yeah. So I'm, I'm gathering that it's a pretty... You know, maybe it's one like of the standards. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'll find that on all the like best of classical, you okay. know, recordings. I'm sure. Okay. Cool. Well, let, yeah. Let's hear some. One of my favorite genres of movies, it's horror movies and mysteries <laughs> and thrillers. Uh-huh. And when I look at the things that appeal to me in uh, the classical pieces that I choose to play, it always has a great, a great bass line. Mm-hmm. But you heard that opening bass. That was just this oh, yeah. that was Oh, yeah. Awesome. Oh, God. Just, it's, it's amazing. And then those wonderful uh, kind of repeated figures in the harmony section. And then the soaring melody comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, and he keeps it fairly dark even in the section here where it you know there's some hope and some happiness some sunshine kind of peeking through the clouds And this first movement is finished, which is which is wonderful. I mean, he finished this yeah. whole movement, and this is the this is the, when I think of the Schubert unfinished, I really only think about this first movement. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if we played the whole symphony, you know, as a youth group. Um, it could have been, you know, we were youngsters. It could have been that we only played this movement, and that's all that I really remember. Um, but here you hear this part that reminds me of like Alfred Hitchcock. You know what I mean? There's just, it's just, it's just really suspenseful music that paints a picture. Uh-huh. And I think as an artist, one of your goals is to do that for your audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the ironic thing for me is that I'm not a big fan of Schubert in general. Really? I don't play any of his piano music. Yeah. I may one day get around to playing that. He has these popular piano pieces called impromptus. I may get around to playing that, mm-hmm. those, but... This was, that's why this, again, is, it's such an ironic thing that this was the piece that drew me in. Um, and none of his other music really speaks to me, <laughs> um, especially not like this. But yeah. when I look at the composers I choose to play, um, when I think about the Beethoven that I choose, it's the Pathetique or the Appassionata, and they all have these foreboding openings. Yeah. Um, all the Rachmaninoff I play has this kind of... Uh, interplay between melancholy and a mm-hmm. you know, little bit of sunshine peeking through, but back to, yeah. you know, the dark side, so to speak. Yeah. I love it because he doesn't spend too much time. He goes back mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to this darker side. And um, people always think of classical music as, you know, kind of this, uh, I, I say people, people who aren't, who don't listen to it a lot, if they have to assume something, they always imagine kind of what you hear on the cartoons, you know? Right. But this has all of the pathos and the drama that keeps me playing this music. Um, And I haven't listened to this on purpose for a very long time, especially once I knew I was going to come in to do Mm -hmm. this. And so to hear it again, um, I don't tear up (laughs) very often over anything. And just to hear those opening strains kind of you know, makes me well yeah. up a little bit because I think b- about how young I was when I first heard this mm-hmm. um, and how profoundly it moved me to hear it. Yeah, I could tell you were sort yeah. of in your own little world <laughs> over <amazing>. there. <laughs> it's just amazing music. 
the uh, something that's been surprising to me learning about classical music is that people tend to people me included tend to think of of classical music as um you know sort of peaceful mm-hmm. uh, meditative mm-hmm. and and you know what has really shocked me is that is pieces like this range, where yeah. you're just exactly you're yeah. listening to it going I don't really understand what I'm feeling, yeah. but I know that it's not peaceful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know that it's, you know, it's it's more in the realm of excitement and there's you an know, agitation so, to yeah, it, right? Yeah. And I think I think this as a little girl, um, just discovering the piano, and you know, you start out in these god awful piano books that, you know, have these awful politically incorrect names, you know, like Indian War Dance oh, or no. something, or, you know, <laughs> Oriental Pagoda, you know, and they, all, and they all sound like some kind of ethnic mishmash, and you're playing these pieces, and but you're hearing all of this great classical music, and that's all you want to get to, yeah. but you're stuck in kind of this purgatory for a while of mm. all of this, you know, these awful John Thompson books and things that you start out as mm-hmm. a beginner, um, so when you, because I started late, I was already hearing this great music. Yeah but kind of being relegated to what beginning pianists have to mm-hmm. play. So when you finally get to put your hands on a piece that feels anything like this, mm-hmm. it's just the most magical moment. Yeah, I imagine that's got to be pretty exciting. It's really exciting. Yeah. Um, what do you, when you play this, the Schubert piece, when you play the Unfinished Symphony, mm-hmm. what is it that you sort of... Um, what is it that you hold in mind when you when you play this? Piece? Well, the last time I played it, you know, I was a young violist. So I was, again, anywhere between 11, 12, maybe 13 years old. And I, rem- I can remember just the start of it, you know, mm-hmm. where the basses do this amazing uh, bass line. And to this day, whenever I play piano concerti, uh, the way they have the piano set, when the lid is up, if it's perfect, you can look right out and see into the eyes of the cellist and the bassist. And I just love making that connection. Yeah. So I think you, what you tend to think of in this piece and what I think of in anything that I'm playing is I need to make a tangible connection within the first five seconds of this piece. And in the case of the Schubert, it was out of my hands because it was up to the basses. Uh, but when you came in on viola on those little repeated notes, you didn't want to spoil whatever the mood was that had been set. Mm -hmm. So as a pianist, we think about not wanting to play a wrong note or having a note stick out, you know, Mm -hmm. like I think about the descending line of the uh, Appassionata Sonata by Beethoven. It's just great bass line and you just want it to flow. Mm -hmm. Um, You don't want to spoil, you don't want to spoil. You Mm -hmm. you want to bring an audience in. And I think with any piece, that's what you're hoping to do. And you're hoping to do it quickly. So yeah. Especially with today's attention spans, you know, <laughs> you can tell within a few seconds if you're going to want to hear the rest of the performance True. that you are now locked into hearing. Yep. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying this. Yeah. <laughs> well, how would you how would you characterize Schubert's other work? Is that you said you're not like a big fan? Well, of you know, because I'm a pianist, of course I know the piano repertoire more, and there are very popular pieces of, of his, The Wanderer of Fantasy that kind of take you on these really long journeys. Mm-hmm. And, and he's known for writing pieces that are very long, mm-hmm. very repetitive. And I think some pianists like myself might get a bad taste in our mouth because we we hear students playing the pieces so often, like in school. Right. And as a student, you haven't quite developed, you know, your, your full musical taste that's always developing. Yeah. And so to have to be tasked with playing something that's 40 minutes long and making it interesting um, and being able to draw an audience in is a very tall order. Yeah. <laughs> I think most of us don't fill that order. And so yeah. that's what we're hearing for a lot of it. Um, and I, I guess more of his music, it, it does have the, this pathos, but there was just nothing of his that really struck me like this piece. So for me, I'm drawn more to Beethoven, mm-hmm. um, who has these kind of rough edges yeah. in his music. Um, I'm not a big Mozart fan. Uh, I think I like to play it more than listen to it mm-hmm. um and so and Rachmaninoff another composer that has this kind of these I, I see in color when I think of music so I think mm-hmm. of Rachmaninoff as having kind of these deep purples and blues that's really you know, funny music yeah well I had um Alicia Lawyer mm-hmm. from from Roko on, on the show and and she was um 
we were talking specifically about the oboe and what what playing the oboe mm -hmm. is is like, and color. That was For all her. she talked about. She yeah. Was, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a condition that I, I, I don't profess to have at all called synesthesia. Synesthesia, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so in this case, there's color, sound, synesthesia, and I did a lot of studying about that topic because I once did a program that combined the artwork of Kandinsky with the music of Scriabin. Right, yeah. And they both were synesthetes. But in my case, it was, and I think in a lot of artists' case, we do kind of associate, at least in a light way, mm -hmm. um, music and, and color, sound and color. So um, even for me, fashion-wise, like mm -hmm. I, there's certain pieces that when I play with orchestra, I can only see myself, you know, in a red gown. It has to be a red gown or, That's great. you know, a blue gown or I can't play the piece. You have to color coordinate and your yeah, outfit it to has the music. To, it feels like I mean, it's just wrong, you know, to play Rhapsody in blue, of course, in an orange gown. Just be wrong. Right. Uh, <laughs> but for me, Rachmaninoff, too, would, would be, you know, shades, of, again, of this indigo color that I always see. So what about the Schubert piece? What do you see yeah, color-wise? I'm this? listening now and I hear <laughs> like a forest green yeah. um, and everything in that spectrum. Mm -hmm. I never see, you know, green to red to orange. It, it's always this very organic kind of shade. You know, so if I see this forest green, everything that comes from it is a lighter shade up to a mint or, you know, maybe even a turquoise. But, yeah. Uh, it's, there's just a darkness there that's also beautiful, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I think I think for me this piece just captured everything that makes you makes you human, mm -hmm. and that back and forth that we all have. So I looked into why this piece was unfinished. Like, why did he never finish it? Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, musicologists don't really agree on on why that was. There's nothing conclusive out there mm -hmm. as far as scholarship on <laughs> why Schubert didn't finish the piece and why he managed to get through two movements and a scherzo, uh -huh. and that was it. Yeah. And uh, so it's going to remain, I suppose, one of the great mysteries of the classical music world. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Maybe Schubert was just, you know, maybe he wasn't a uh, completer. He didn't get back to it. He was, he got <laughs> distracted by another project, <laughs> and he was like, you know, but it seems like it was a little more complex. You know, artists by nature are ambitious, you know, and we want to, I know at least in my own life, everything that I do, I want it to be something no one else has done. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to keep being original or, or you think you're being unique and then you find out somebody already did something very sure. similar to that. And um, sometimes you bite off more than you can chew. Sometimes if, if Schubert was anything uh, like me, he probably had multiple projects going on mm -hmm. at once. Um, and I think the, the fear that we all, all live with, and, and artists maybe especially, is that you are going to die and not finish something really great. And I think what, I keep using this word ironic because it, it's suitable. I think what's, what's interesting with this piece is that even though he didn't finish it, he already made something really great just in the first two movements, um, which gives me a little bit of relief you know, you're always thinking your best is coming, mm -hmm. uh, which I do believe, you know, if we're still alive, it's because we still have something else really great to do. But if we don't get to whatever we think that is, there's a good chance we've already done something pretty worthwhile. <laughs> that is, I you love know? that. <laughs> so <laughs> I can sleep a little bit easier tonight. You know, if I don't wake up tomorrow, I can probably, people can look back and see something worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, and so to think that something this beautiful, um, is even considered unfinished mm -hmm. is interesting. And what I think tends to motivate a lot of artists that I know is this feeling that they're they're trying to say it, whatever yeah. it is, you know, and and they keep going and they keep creating yeah. because they kind of said it, but not quite. not quite. They didn't quite That's say it in the right it way. Changes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the problem is that it changes. And um, yeah. I think as an artist, we need to start from scratch about every two to three years. And when I look over my life the last five, six years or so, that's what I've been doing. And each time I've started from what f feels like scratch, basically what I'm doing is 
taking a little bit of what's been working, mm-hmm. moving forward with that, but being very honest about where it is I want to go. Yeah. Not lying to myself or saying, this is what a concert piano should look like. This is what she should do. Mm-hmm. But this is what I really see myself doing. Right. And it's okay if I didn't feel that way last year. Right. It's really okay. That's great. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if, if, you know, I mean, this is... This is pure speculation mm-hmm. because Schubert lived, I don't know, a zillion years ago. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if he was maybe experiencing something like that as as a composer at this time Gosh. in his life when he when he started working on this unfinished symphony. Like he he made this really ambitious leap into starting something new, something different, because clearly it's uh you know, it's, it's quite different from the rest of his work. He's, he's beginning kind of the romantic era, yeah. you know, um, which I think is what makes him so great and maybe why his piano music doesn't appeal because so his piano expensive. music is still kind of in the classical range. Uh, it starts it. to cross okay. over more into the romantic range. I think the speculation makes sense because I think any composer we're still talking about today it's only because they were doing something new and great. Yeah. I mean, because how many more composers were there? You know, that we'll <laughs> never really hear about, or they were kind of one-hit wonders. But yeah. these these men and women who still, who their legacies still last, they were all doing something that no one had really done, mm-hmm. you know, until then. I mean, you think about Beethoven and how he started to play with these, um, these amazing harmonies, and then you had... Mozart, who was doing stuff improvisation-wise that no one had done mm-hmm. before him, and Liszt, who revolutionized piano technique. Mm-hmm. We love and hate him for that because the music <laughs> got remarkably harder um, after he started messing around with the instrument. But the only reason we're talking about them is because they did something mm-hmm. really great and different. And I think the saddest part is I don't know if they felt that way. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. But, but they did. They really changed the game. Clearly, they did. I mean, like you said, it's hundreds of years later, Mm -hmm. and we're still sitting here having this completely um, contemporary discussion about about their creative process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of mind blowing. Well, and I think (laughs) when you talk about, you know, in the pop world, you know, your Billy Idols and your Elton John's and your Madonna's and your Lady mm-hmm. Gaga's. I mean, mm-hmm. they're all doing something. Or, or and I think in Lady Gaga's case, kind of recycling a bit of what's worked right. in the past and adding her own, you know, kind of flair and panache to it, which makes it new. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll probably be talking about them. You know, I don't know about in a hundred years. Okay, but, okay. You so, know? so here's a question. Here's <laughs> a question. All right. So I love me some Lady Gaga. Okay. But, but I'm wondering, like, I, I, okay. So. Lady Gaga, mm-hmm. she's she's uh, she's clearly a pop artist, mm-hmm. you know? and there are other people who are making sort of contemporary rock music and mm-hmm. hip hop and things like that, who are doing things that are a little more complex, yeah, maybe a little deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, okay, we zoom 150 years into the future. Yeah, do you really think we'll be talking about? some of the creators today in the same way that we're talking about Schubert. Well, I mean, I think you can see an example in two, three very specific cases. Um, The Beatles, of course. Sure. Jimi Hendrix Uh and Bob Marley. Uh Right? I mean, you think about how different they were for their era and how when they hit, it was just so huge. Who the heck are these people? Mm -hmm. Now, Lady Gaga will be a more complex discussion because it will be, will it be a discussion of music or will it be a discussion of uh, commercial genius and Mm -hmm. branding and marketing? Sort of performance art? Performance art, but I mean, I think her legacy, her legend, and I mean this with with no offense because um, I think she really is a, a musical genius in many ways, but I think... The genius that will be worth discussing even more Mm -hmm. is how she completely saw what the music industry was missing Mm -hmm. and reinvented herself to fit a void in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And then in a very um, ballsy way, I mean, just decided to to go for it. And uh, I'll be honest, when she first came out, I thought, okay, she'll be around for about a month. (laughs) I just really thought. And I was completely wrong. And when I look at all the things she's done behind the scenes and um, like with Kodak and, you know, with fashion. Right, the Polaroid thing. Yeah. That was so cool. She's a very, very, very brilliant woman. 
Getting back to the Schubert,、mm-hmm. that in fact Schubert was、um, a little bit of an entrepreneur,、yeah. and that he he made music on a subscription basis、That's、to make to、stuff. make music <laughs> or, or to make money rather, and、uh, and that he would、uh, throw concerts. House concerts and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, a to make lot. Money of, a lot of those guys did that, and they did it in a musical standpoint to kind of air out, you know, the new music they were presenting.、Uh-huh. Beethoven did a lot of this, and、uh, Schubert, Schumann as well, Brahms. Those guys were also writers, and they had newsletters that went out.、Um, so I think it's really neat to look back at at these composers as arts entrepreneurs、mm-hmm. as well. They、mm-hmm. understood that if they wanted their music to be heard. Uh, you know, they had to learn how to to promote. They had to、music. do PR. They had to do PR. I mean, it wasn't as extensive. They, of course, didn't have the access to what we have today. But we have that mindset. We we understand. I could either practice and compose for 24 hours a day,、mm-hmm. or I could promote myself for 24 hours a day, or I could find a balance and figure out how to do it.、Mm-hmm. Now, Schubert ultimately kind of. Failed in that Mozart as well. They all, you know, died with not a lot of money. Yeah.、Um, which speaks to the fact that artists need more training in the business area、yeah. of things. It's still the same today. But I like to hear those stories because it makes me feel a little more normal.、Mm-hmm. Um, that I'm not weird for thinking that my art should not only be、um, something that I value and think of as sacred, but that it should also be viable.、Mm-hmm. I should be able to make a career. And a living from it,、sure. and not be ashamed to admit that that's something I want from it.、It's、from a very early age, we're just told to practice、mm-hmm. and to focus on the art. And then, as we get older, we are almost made to devalue our personalities,、mm-hmm. right? So, some of us come to the table with very lively artistic personalities, and we're sometimes told either very openly、um, or You know, you get in the right setting and you feel it being suppressed. That the music is not about you.、Mm-hmm. This is about the composer.、Yeah. This is about the art form. So make sure you take all of yourself out of it. And it's really, it's really a negative thing because what happens then is the music starts to become plain and bland. We spend all of our time just trying to recreate what we think the music was like、yeah. um, back in the day, and we forget that when an audience pays their money to come hear you. They could also just go buy a CD.、Mm-hmm. So if they're sitting down in a hall, in this day and age, especially,、mm-hmm. you know, put all their extra activities aside, left their homes that have media rooms and surround sound,、mm-hmm. and come to hear you, they probably want a little bit of you too. Yeah.、Um, so I like to kind of challenge artists to find that balance. Where do you fit into this art that you're? Creating Jade, this has been a really interesting discussion. It kind of took a direction from Schubert I wasn't, to Lady Gaga. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't really thinking that we were going to get into you know、um, Schubert as a sort of failed entrepreneur, <laughs> <laughs> but he kind of was. But you know, and I think for me, what I'm taking away is this idea of、uh, looking like it may be unfinished on paper,、uh-huh. but trusting that you know we're here for a very specific journey and that.、Uh-huh. Even if we don't get to where we think we're supposed to get, you know, we're really blessed if we've touched somebody with some piece of what we've done. And for Schubert, I can say, you know, hearing that piece、uh, was the moment that I knew、uh, the rest of my life would involve classical music.、Yeah. And、uh, and so I, for me, it was it was a life changing experience. Well, that's that's pretty powerful, you know, that that a piece of of quote unquote unfinished music、yeah. literally changed the course of someone's life. Well. Thank you so much for coming on to the program. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, busy lady. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> sure, everybody.、Uh, if you have a question that you would like to have addressed on the classical classroom, please feel free to send me an email at dclay at classical nine one seven dot org. And、uh, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.